Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Really praying that you all can hear me. Let me check my sound here. Make sure that I'm on. Hope everyone is having a blessed, blessed, blessed day. We're just waiting for people to call in. Once I see somebody live, then I will begin to share. But I hope you all are having a great beginning of your week. I can't believe it's July. I was just talking to my husband about that today and saying, can you believe it's already July? Let me make sure my sound is working. doesn't okay praise the lord so we're going to go ahead and get started hopefully everybody can hear me my sound is saying that it is on and you know how we do on tuesdays it's inspired tuesdays this is my opportunity to hopefully inspire encourage and see people's lives transform join you in the study of the bible and so we're going to be studying how to overcome fear today which is something that I have definitely battled through in my own life and had to overcome. So I'm going to be talking from experience, but really teaching the Word of God. What does the Word have to say? You know, that's what I'm all about. What does the Word have to say about different issues that are practical happening in our lives every single day? I like to be very practical, scripturally based, and get straight to the heart of God when it comes down to whatever the topic is that we are seeking the Lord on. So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. And I know many of you will view me and this video later on. So welcome and leave any questions or comments in the comment section. If you have any for me and I will look back through and hopefully be able to answer anything that you want to ask. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this awesome, awesome week that you have blessed us being able to enter into. We know that the plans you have for every single one of us are good and not evil. You have plans for us to prosper and not to fail. You have plans to bring us to an expected end. And for that, we say thank you. We thank you that every single one of our days, every moment of our life is already planned out by you, laid out by you. And even this moment we're in, this very second, walking through fear and battling fear, overcoming fear, was designed by you. And we will see that in your word today. Not for us to falter, not for us to fall, not for us to stay there, but for us to win the battle and to get the victory. That is your plan for us, Lord. That's what we're asking for, the spirit of victory to fall upon every person that is listening, every person that's watching, whether they're driving down the street right now, listening to this before they go to bed, when they first get up in the morning, if they're listening to this throughout the day and want to put it on repeat. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your divine presence that is with all of us as we are listening to your voice even more than mine. Remove me out the way so that you can get the glory and so that your people can hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you all about overcoming fear by faith, by faith and through faith today. And this message, as I said at the beginning, is very important to me personally because I went through a huge season of battling with fear. And I always say the spirit of fear because the Bible says in Timothy, God has not given us what? The spirit of fear, but he has given us power, love, and a sound mind. So he gives us three attributes to overcome this one area of fear power over the enemy. The Bible says God's given us power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm us. 
love, perfect love, cast out all fear and a sound mind. God has given us a peace that goes beyond all understanding. So he gives us soundness of mind, which is not double mindedness. We're one minute we're trusting the Lord and one minute we're in faith, but it's a soundness of peacefulness, a shalom that is on our lives when we trust in the Lord. And with all that said, I, I, my heart goes out to anyone that deals with fear. I went through what I would say now looking back was chronic fear for many years of my childhood going into my adulthood. Fears of almost everything you could imagine, bad things happening to me. Fears of public speaking, fear of what people would think of me. Just crazy, irrational fears that would attack me. And it took me a while to realize that I was under a spiritual attack. This was not who I was. If you deal with fear, you can feel like it's actually you, that you're, you are shy or you are a fearful person when really it's something external that's trying to make you feel like it's actually you, that, is, that that's part of your character and it's part of who you are. And so if that's something you're dealing with, it's good to remember that God has not designed you to be a fearful person, a nervous person. We talked about anxiety and worry last week. God has not designed us to have anxiety and to have worry in our lives. So when that comes to attack us and comes against us, we as Christians have the power and the authority and even told or commanded to bring those things down and take authority over them uh, with the power of Christ. So today I want to actually come out of Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, the Lord really laid that passage on my heart. And I want to talk about something that you all have already heard about. You've probably heard this message a million times, but stick with me because I believe it's going to speak to you in a fresh way today. We're going to talk about Jesus when he walked on water and one other person walked on water with him, Peter. And if you look at Matthew chapter 14 in context, if you go back to Matthew chapter 13, what do we see in Matthew 13? In Matthew 13, we see Jesus going back home, right? He's going to Nazareth. And if you look at the New, Te New Testament map, you will actually see that Nazareth is, pretty, Nazareth is pretty far from the Sea of Galilee where he walked in water in Matthew chapter 14. So he leaves Nazareth. And you remember why, because the people there did not have faith in him. <laughs> they could not see beyond who Jesus was as a child. When they're like, you were just this little boy. We can't believe that you can be more than what you, we, we have you in a box as. And I think that that's a great context for the fear that we see in chapter 14. And the reason why I see a parallel or a connection, actually a bridge between those two, is because many of the people that are watching this, what, one of the things that hinders you in your childhood is that people in your life or even into your adulthood cannot see your true identity. They cannot see who you really are. So therefore, what do people do when they can't see your identity and when they can't believe in you and they don't see who you really are? I'll tell you, what people do is they begin to speak words that are not true and that are not of God over your life. And they, and you can actually feel it if you are a feeler and a spiritual person that feels things a lot. And sometimes you can feel, you, you just have a sense or you have an intuition that tells you that people aren't really believing in who God says I am. They can't see beyond it. And I'll give you an example of this in real life from my own story. There was a time where my husband and I were pastoring a church in downtown Atlanta. And at this point, we were really just really thriving in a lot of ways. In other ways, we weren't. But we were seeing a lot of college students come to know Christ. We were seeing the Spirit of God poured out in our ministry. We were just the youth coming on Friday nights and worshiping God and using their talents and many of them are now pastors and leaders in ministry and doing amazing things for Jesus. Well, we were seeing all this happen and we did it out of a warehouse that we had turned into our local church. And so it was a 16,000 square foot 
warehouse that a really prosperous couple had pretty much almost donated to us to use. And we, we didn't have much, but they believed in our vision and they believed in our heart. So long story short, people were flooding in. We had lots of friends that wanted to learn from us and were asking us questions and wondering how we were doing it. And eventually we got the whole space and turned the top into a loft where we uh, lived on the top as our parsonage and the bottom level we used for ministry. So it was just, we were having a blast. Then we got across the street, this prime location, it was the Georgia Dome and the World Congress Center, we were doing conferences out of there and on billboards and everything. So this was just like, woo, <laughs> an amazing season of our life, a great time that we were thoroughly enjoying. But at, but at a certain point, we knew that this couple who was elderly was going to pass. They were in their 80s and they were, their health was declining. And the, the the owner, the husband actually died first, which we were surprised by. And when he died, we found out he had no will. And so everything in a moment was going. Kind of like if you read the story of Job, just in a second, <laughs> he's starting to get letters and calls and people are coming to his door saying, hey, all your stuff is going, your children are going, all these things are going. And just yesterday I looked over the past five years of our life and it was very much like Job, but then there was these great things happening, like having children and things like that. So in this season though, especially when people begin to see that the physical or the natural things were being stripped away from us and we weren't seeing it anymore. People started having all kinds of reasons like humans do for, you know, with Job, they started saying, maybe you're sinning or you did something wrong. The same thing started happening and gossiping and all that around us. And people would say things like, oh, you were such a great college pastor for me. But at this season, the Lord's telling me to go somewhere else, you know, and it, it's like a backhand compliment. Your way of saying like, you can do this in college, but you can't help me as an adult. And so there was a huge attack on our confidence. And if we're not careful, we could just bow down to fear and say, oh my goodness, this must be true. Like we can't plant a church and we can't do anything for Jesus anymore. And, and it, our ministry to the youth is just not as important as to adults and we can never reach adults. But if you look at what God is saying, that's totally not true. If you look at who we are in Christ, that's absolutely not true that we can't after 15 year, 14 years of marriage, help people with their marriages, or after years of infertility, help people through real life adult situations where they're waiting on something from God, or after years of being disobedient as teenagers and young adults that we can't help people with their kids. And so that's how the, that's just an example of how the enemy works through other people in situations to create fear. And when we get here, not only do we, in the Bible, not only do we see Jesus going through this intense war over his identity, he's flowing and functioning in all these other places, but there's this core group of people that are closest to him that just can't see who he is and just can't get his calling. And they are literally pushing back against it and he can't even function in these amazing gifts we see him functioning in all throughout the rest of the Gospels. And then he finds himself traveling and he ends up on the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. And as he's there, he's with his disciples and all these multitudes, the Bible says 5,000 people, come to, men come to him and that doesn't include the women and children. So there's thousands of people and he does this miracle and feeds all them right after his own family and closest friends he grew up with say he can't do it. And that just goes to show you that one thing that we have to overcome with fear is we cannot worry about what other people think about us or what other people say. We have to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit and what he's speaking over our life, what he is saying to us, and keep going even if you don't see results in certain locations or situations in ministry. And your ministry may not be preaching or teaching like I'm doing. It may be at home. It may be with your kids. It may be with family members. It may be in business. Just because you don't see the results right away or in the way you thought you would does not mean that you're not where you should be and that you cower down to fear that tells you, well, maybe you just can't do this and just 
draw back into a shell and do something else, be disobedient. So I want to encourage anybody with that that needed to hear that. The second part of this is after this miraculous moment, and we'll see these ebbs and flows in Jesus' ministry, Jesus begins to go up to a mountain. And as he, before he goes up, he tells the disciples, I want you to go ahead and go on the boat ahead of me to the, back to the west coast of the Sea of Galilee. So they get, they're obedient. They get in the boat and they begin to get on this passage across the Sea of Galilee to the west coast. And when, at, when this happens, he goes to the mountain, he has this moment of solitude. And, all, and as they're out there, a storm begins to come, right? And it begins to shake them. And I, it's at night, so it's dark. Let's look at Matthew 14, 22 and read about this encounter because this gives us a lot of information on what happens in our calling that causes us to be afraid and how do we respond to it in the cycles of our faith. So Matthew 14, 22 says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land. So we know that it's nighttime. We know that his disciples are alone this time in the boat. We know that Jesus is also alone. We know that on purpose, he decreased the amount of people in his ministry in this moment. And it says, this time the boat was battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was going against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, it's a ghost. They cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So that's our key scripture if you're taking notes. Matthew 14, 27. Jesus says, take heart, it's I. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. So we have a command there. And I heard somebody say that, do not fear. Fear. That command is in the Bible 365 times. One for every day of the year. Do not be afraid because God knows that that, that fear is one of the things that hinders us from our call and hinders us from our purpose and we are to fight it. So in verse 28, Peter answers, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out the boats, he starts walking on the water and he comes toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong one, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand, catches him, saying, you a little faith, why did you doubt? Then he gets in the boat and the wind ceases. And those in the boat worship him saying, truly you are the son of God. Now that's the whole story, right? That's Matthew 14, 22 to 33. That's the story that we're going to pull from today when we're talking about fear. One of the things that I want you to know is that Jesus did not come quickly to the disciples' rescue. He let them go through this battle for a while. Are you in a battle today? Sometimes it's not because you did anything wrong or because the Lord is mad at you or because life is just horrible, but sometimes you are literally smack dab in the middle of God's will for you, and yet and still his will is that you go through the storm. Why? Just so that you have to be in pain and go through something you don't want to? No. He was training the disciples by their fears, and he was instructing them to be ready to endure. So he's like, look, I'm, I'm putting you in, in this environment on, for a reason, for a purpose. Now, I used to run track, and one of the things that they did when we were training is you had to go through painful things over and over and over again on a track. Any type of training does not feel good, but it is so worthwhile in the end when it comes to competition. So the Lord will allow these situations to teach us to endure and to teach us to trust Him and to teach us to have faith. When things start falling apart in your life, when the job doesn't go the way you thought it was, or you're going through financial difficulty, you're fighting sickness, and family members are acting crazy, and your kids aren't listening to you, 
all of these things are fine tuning us and they're teaching us how to have faith in him as we go through it. We really don't know where we're at with our faith until we go through a difficult situation, until we go through a storm symbolically, until we go through a challenge. That's when we realize, oh, okay, this is where my faith is. This is where my trust is. This is where, is it in the Lord or is it in this job or is it in whatever? Is it something in the natural or is it really that I'm believing in the Lord spiritually? So gently and by degrees, God excites and urges the disciples on towards greater responsive, responsiveness. So we see that the Lord will allow us to go through storms on purpose so that we can grow and so that we can see where we're at with him and where our faith is. Another thing out of Matthew 14, 22 to 33, when we're talking about these disciples walking on water and Jesus appearing to them, but not after a period of him withdrawing his presence, not being there, is that the first time this happened was in Matthew 8 and Mark 4. So the first time that, if you remember, the first time that the disciples found themselves in a storm, Jesus was in the boat with them, right? So here is Jesus, he's laying in the boat with them, and, and they panicked. <laughs> so on this level of their maturity, he let them feel his presence. He let them see him right there with them. They they were confident that, oh, he is here. He's right here in this boat. But they were still mad that he was resting and he was at peace and he wasn't responsive to the winds and the waves and he was acting like nothing was happening. As you mature in the Lord, he will withdraw himself at times where you don't feel anything. You don't see him. You can't sense him. It's like, what is going on? Everything's dark. He's up on the mountain praying and you're panicking, right? So as you mature, the test goes to another degree <laughs> and another level. And sometimes it extends a period of time that you're you're feeling alone and that you're not seeing him and it feels like you're in a wilderness or you're in this boat all by yourself will extend and he'll withdraw the help from other people at times. You can't get a hold of people that usually would help you or come to your rescue you can't seem to get a hold of him it doesn't seem like you're hearing him clearly things are confusing confusing that's what a storm is and he told them to go there and we know that because in matthew 14 it says he made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead to the other side and then he went out to the mountain to pray so they were out of their obedience Hey, Paige, thank you. So out of their obedience, they were having to go through something hard. And I took some notes on this and I thought that is deep that Jesus tells us to go ahead of him at times and to go into a scary place, to go into a place of aloneness or the storm. We're obeying him and then all of a sudden, it's like all hell breaks loose. What, <laughs> what is going on? We're wondering, are we going to die? Is everything going to fall apart? Am I make, did I make the right decision to get on this boat? Was that really God? Did I hear Jesus correctly? If life was better, you know, before I obeyed him, maybe if only my life was the same. But there are times where we'll obey God and we'll do everything that he told us to do. And things seem to get worse in the natural Things seem to get more crazy, more difficult. People are coming against us worse. The storms and the winds and waves are blowing and hitting us at every direction. And we don't see or hear him or feel him the way that we did before. And that is, to me, a sign of maturity. Because like I said, when we look at Matthew chapter 8 and when we look at Mark chapter 4, where was Christ? He was in the boat, right? He was in the boat. And, and that's where we expect him to be. But by the time we get to Matthew chapter 14, he is far away. He is on a mountaintop. The reason why he's on this mountaintop is because he wants to blow our minds. He wants to bring us to a place where we can have faith in him even when we can't see or feel him right there with us. And everything seems like it's being stripped away. So suddenly he appears. And the funny thing, if you think about this text in Matthew 14, 
is that when Christ appeared, it, you would think that they would be like, yes, he's finally here, right? This is amazing. But they thought he was a ghost and got scared. They were so scared that of all the stuff going on around them, all the situations and the circumstances and the storm that when he showed up, they're like, oh my goodness. They had never encountered Christ in that way. And so this encounter terrified them until one of them rose up in their faith and said, hey, can I come out there? If this is really you, bring me out to the water with you. Draw me closer to you. And we know that's all about intimacy, right? And so I also thought about the children of Israel after they crossed the Red Sea. Didn't the same thing happen? Same as that thing happened when they... <laughs> got to the other side and you see them crossing this water which is a lot of symbolism with crossing waters right then they complained when they got in the other side and they said man I would rather be not in this place of faith that I have to be in right now I don't want to be in this place of faith where Yahweh has me right now I want to be in a comfortable place and even if comfort means that I have to go back to what was not good for me if i have to go back to bondage at least i'm comfortable with that bondage and that's where they were it's a crazy thing to think that you can actually be more comfortable with what's not healthy than a new place or another level of faith that god has for you and so when the children of israel crossed the red sea they complained they didn't want the supernatural provision that yahweh was given to them instead they they wanted to eat what the Egyptians were just freely handing out to them, kind of like food stamps. It's like, I'll take the food stamps and I'll take the assistance from the government and I'll take just staying here and being stuck and not having my own prosperity if it means I don't have to trust and I don't have to put my dependence on the Lord. So here are these, here are these disciples are, and at this place as well, they could not really turn back. You know, sometimes we go so deep with God that we can't turn back. We we don't know where to go. We're we're out in this boat and we're we've stepped out by faith so much in obedience that there's nowhere else really for us to go. They couldn't go back to the east of the Sea of Galilee, which is where they were, because the storm and the wind was blowing against them. They had to keep going forward. <laughs> And sometimes that's where we're at. We, we have no choice but to keep going forward. And we have to accept God in whatever form he chooses to come to us. And in this time, it was in a shocking way. Well, I looked at some of the symbolism and some Bible scholars believe that this is very symbolic of Christ when he would be resurrected, right? And he would come back and the disciples were did the same reaction. They were like, whoa. He's coming back in, in this supernatural way and visiting us again, right? And they, they had a hard time believing. They didn't want him to suffer, and he had to go through that alone. And then they did, when he came and was resurrected. So in all these levels of us knowing Christ, we grow, and we have to rise higher in our faith and move beyond fear to enter into another level of understanding him, another level of walking with him. So Peter is the one that does that, and he walks with him until what happens. He starts looking around to him again at his situation, and he starts to doubt. What is he doubting in this situation? Now, this can go deep, but I believe that what Peter was doubting was not just, oh my goodness, I can't walk on the water, but he was <coughs> doubting and not focused on Christ that was empowering him to do this anymore. Maybe he started looking at himself too much, and his own abilities and his own uh, uh, strength, right? And he started saying, well, I can't do this. Have you ever been there before where it's like God has you out somewhere and you're doing something and you're walking in the miracles like the children of Israel did right? when they were out there with Moses and they're seeing all these signs and wonders. And at a certain point, it's like, I can't keep functioning in this level. I can't keep doing this. I can't move it, keep moving by faith. My enemies are too great. The resistance is too strong around me. And so I just have, I, don't, I feel like I'm freezing, right? And that's what happened to Peter. And then of course, Christ had to lift him back up and get home back onto the boat and out of the water. So all of this is happening in, the, in, in this passage. And we're seeing 
the disciples go through these amazing phases with their walk with him, with Christ. One of the things that really strikes me as well in this passage is that they had literally just seen Christ be the God of miracles, of signs and wonders right before this and when they were on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. They had just seen him multiply and provide miraculously and then it was a huge drop off. Like everything just stopped. <laughs> There was no more miracles, no more signs, no more wonders. A crazy, crazy season of a storm. And I believe that re that represents the seasons of our soul as believers as we walk with him. That, and even in our relationship with him is that you're going to have these times, like I mentioned in our life, where it seems glorious and everyone wants to be your friend, right? <laughs> because you got stuff going for you. you got, we had the church and the building and students coming to us. You know, some people will not even talk to us now that we don't have that. They're irresponsive to our messages. They don't hang out with us. They act like they don't know us. They don't want to be seen publicly with us. But that's all good because we know that after this, there's other seasons where they get blessed in those in a different way again. And they start seeing signs, wonders, and miracles. And now they know where people's hearts are. And they know who to bring with them in certain places. So there, this season, if you're going through that of fear of calling, fear of going deeper, fear of walking out onto the Sea of Galilee is a good place to be in even though it does not feel like it and the world around you will tell you that it's not <laughs> no one is signing up to be in a storm but storms are where we grow storms are where we mature storms are where we receive revelation when they were in this dark place their eyes had to look at the light that was beyond the natural darkness, and that was Christ. And they grew. There's so much revelation of his power, his anointing, his authority that comes in the secret place, Psalm 91, that we do not have when it's busy and loud around us. When we're in that quiet, alone place in prayer, that's where, even if it's a storm going around us, we receive huge revelation for the next season when we're surrounded by people again and when we have to do heavy levels of ministry so suddenly he appears and his presence appears differently because that's what they're supposed to learn about christ in that moment is that he's not just this physical man but he's also the son of god and so they they receive this message about him being a messiah like the revelation the lights don't come in when all the miracle signs and wonders are happening primarily they come in in this storm and when they see his salvation come right out of that storm that's where they get the revelation of who he is on another level that he's more than a prophet but he is actually the messiah as well and that's where we get those revelations as well in an experiential way so to me this shows that um in the pre in this in the previous storm he's in the ship but this time it shows maturity it shows maturity when god entrusts you to go through storms all by yourself as a woman of god or as a man of god he, when he entrusts you to go through it and you're feeling alone, that's congratulations, right? That is a sign that you have went to another level spiritually, that he can entrust you with the test. That's what he did with every person, Moses, with Abraham, with Joseph, with Esther. He brings, even Esther, she had to stay by herself and go through this fast that she was on. It's a sign that he is entrusting you. And you'll know that you pass the test by the way that you respond to the storm. You will know that you pass the test by the way you respond to the storm and by the way that you see yourself and him in the storm. If you begin to think, oh, I'm such a loser and my life is just horrible and everything's falling apart, then it's a sign that, okay, my faith was in something else. Maybe my faith was in having people's approval. Maybe my faith was in seeing things manifest a certain way and it wasn't in that my obedience is worship and love and that is enough. So through 
withdrawal of his manifest presence of what you've been familiar with, what do we do in that moment? We look for his presence in the new way. <coughs> we say, how are you showing yourself afresh to me? Many times where people get stuck at this point is I don't see him the way he used to come, so he must not be here for me anymore. He must not be with me. I don't see him in this boat. He was in the boat before. I've been here before. I know what it's like to be in the storm. I know what this is like to be in this boat, but he's not here that way anymore. So, oh no, I'm panicking. But instead we should say, what is the new way that you, what are you trying to show me afresh? What is the new revelation of you that you're trying to reveal to me? Now we know that because when Abraham went up to the mountaintop, there was a ram in the thicket and he learned something new about the provision of Yahweh, right? And so that's that's what we're supposed to get out of these dark, dark times and new kind of tests and storms. So I wanted to share that with you, hoping that it would be an encouragement to those that may be going through fear or a storm. And the last thing I want to leave us with just because of time is I want to go to um, to Joshua. I got my New Testament here, so I have to use my laptop for this one. But I love this scripture because when we first started planting a work, we didn't know what it was going to be in Atlanta. This is the scripture. This is the passage that we got uh, before we left to go step out by faith to do what we felt like we were called to do. Joshua 1 9, it says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. And what I love about this passage, the context of this passage is talking about stepping out by faith, right? How do we overcome fear? Well, we step out onto the water. We step out by faith. And I love love the context of that because Joshua has set, had been set under somebody for a really, really long time. He was used to going to church, in a sense, <laughs> or being a part of the bigger picture of the assembly and now, after doing this for many years, he is put in this position of authority. So we see Moses anoint him with oil, install him into this mantle. Moses goes on, he enters into the rest. He's no longer with the people. And Joshua is the next leader in line. Now, that's a lot of pressure to lead a group of people. And this is over a million people, many believe that Joshua is having to lead. Have you ever been in a situation where you're you're in a crowd and someone's leading and they point and it's to you and you think they're pointing to somebody behind you? It's like, surely you can't be calling me. <laughs> I remember one time that happened, Miss Hawkins, my junior or sixth grade math teacher, actually she was my teacher, but we were in math class at the time doing a math lesson. And she called me, and I was so nervous to go up there. And she said, what's two by two, two times two? And I was like, eight? Because <laughs> I was so nervous. I was like, surely you cannot be calling me to come to the front and put this on the board. And, of course, the whole class laughed. And I was like, oh, this went exactly the way I thought it would. But all jokes aside, there are times where that's what God is doing. He's like, I'm choosing you. I'm pointing <laughs> on you i want you to be peter that takes that first step and moves out into the water and takes leadership and walks in that authority without fear and this is what he does with joshua now why would yahweh choose joshua we know a reason why right because they had been through this journey and the when the spies had went and looked for looked at this land of canaan the first time what happened Joshua and Caleb were the only two people that had faith and that didn't give a bad report of full of fear. So he had this attribute of faith about him years before he had went into this promised land. And so here he is. But even with all that faith, he's reminded again, do not fear. I want you to be strong that all this stuff in the land is so it's there at this point. It's designed to be there for you to overcome. 
and your job is to obey your job is to not turn from the left or the right so that you can be successful wherever you go your job is to meditate on the truth no matter what you're seeing in front of you your job is to know that the plans that God has for you are for you to prosper and to be successful and, and to be strong and to know that he's with you wherever you're going. And I found that in all of the situations and challenges that I've been through, that's been the hardest, is do I really believe he is with Jade Lee no matter what season? Whether I have much or whether I have less, whether everything seems to be working out for me or things aren't working out for me, whether I'm in a hospital bed or whether I am <laughs> in a place where everybody's saying Hosanna, Hosanna and clapping for me, do I believe that he is who he says he is and that his, pl his plans and his words over my life are yes and amen, that he's not a man that he would lie that he's going to fulfill what he said he would fulfill, regardless of what people or my situation tells me. And that's what causes us not to be fearful because we're on, standing on the rock. So he gets this assignment and he's told to remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave him after he said, the Lord will give you rest by giving you this land, your wives, your children, your livestock, may stay in the land i'm reading out joshua chapter 1 verse 14 all that you have will stay in the land that moses gave you east of the jordan but all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow israelites so do you see the pattern here again they're told go ahead of everyone else go ahead and go cross over cross over to the new place that you're called to you are to help them until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you. And until they too have taken possession of the land your Lord your God has given them. After that you may go back and occupy your own land. Which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua. Whatever you command us we will do. Wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses we will obey you. Only may the Lord be with you as he was with Moses. And then they ended only be strong and courageous. So. I'll end with sharing this that came to my heart in prayer when I was preparing for this is that I really feel like there are people watching this and I hinted towards this last week that there is an assignment that you have been given and Christ is depending on you in a new way in a new level than what you may he you may have thought he depended on you before it's a it has to do with leadership it has to do with authority it has to do with leadership of other people and it can be dark it can be scary to lead people it can be lonely to lead people but you're the one that he's chosen for this assignment and so the the posture is a posture of confidence it is a posture of peace it is a posture of reliance on the word and it is a posture of listening to the to the level of intimacy that you're supposed to be going to in this season that aloneness is not something to be afraid of or to push away it is something to embrace because there's going to be a time coming where you're so busy and surrounded by so many people and things that you'll be missing <laughs> this season and i'm speaking to myself as well so we're uh moving forward and what i'm going to do is i'm going to keep teaching on these basic truths of the word i'm calling them basics that we all just need to remember sometimes so that i can build a library that we can all go back to and listen to and pray through like i said if you ever have any questions um or comments that you want to post on here even after the teaching is over live Feel free to post them and I should get a notification that you added a comment and I can uh, respond to any questions or thoughts that you have about the text that we went through uh, for whatever week that I'm teaching on. So thank you everybody for viewing. I saw my mom on here and Paige and I know that there will be more people that will come on here later. So thank you as well for watching this short teaching 
people on building up your faith and walking in faith even in a dark, dark place because it has to do with us understanding Christ and knowing our calling. Well, that's it for today. If anybody has any questions, I'll pause for a second for questions or comments. And then I'm going to let you all go. <laughs> You're welcome. So I encourage y'all to look up um, 1 John 4.18 as well throughout your week. Because that's a great one for identity when we're talking about faith. Well, let's go ahead and pray. And we will end this broadcast for today. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to dig into your word a little bit. To look at these basic truths that have to do with faith. To think about the season that we're in and to meditate on it and to say, give us clarity. To say, show us what you're trying to say to us and what you're doing in our lives. Individually and corporately. Help us embrace the assignment that you have for us in this particular moment and season. Help us to have a confidence and a joy and a peace about what we are called to do right now. And I thank you for the boot that you've designed for each of us to be in. I thank you for the storms that come around us that point towards your glory. And I thank you for the manifestation of you walking towards us on the water, on the sea, showing us that you are with us even when we can't see it in ways that are fresh and new and that bring us a new level of faith and joy. Pray for anybody that may be dealing with fear. We say that you have not given us fear, but you have given us power over fear. So we take power and authority over fear and we walk in love, peace, and confidence right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Well, bless you and enjoy the remainder of your week. I will see you next Tuesday, and I'll let you know the next time we have another interview coming up. God bless.